and welcome to Silux, the podcast where we talk about scientific developments and technological changes in Luxembourg, as usual, proudly powered by Research Luxembourg and recording at the Media Center of the University of Luxembourg. And in today's episode, our guest is Dr. German Castignani, who is AI and data analytics platform leader at Luxembourg Institute of Science and Technology, and he currently leads the Digital Twin Innovation Center there. He was a co-founder of Motion S, the first spin-off of the SNT at the University of Luxembourg in the field of mobility data analytics. His research interests include digital twins, vehicular technologies, connected and automated driving, risk assessment and predictive modeling for energy and mobility systems. German, thank you so much for coming today. Thank you for having me here. In the introduction, a few buzzwords, I have to say, buzzwords that people really like. AI is one. The other one is digital twins. So we did talk a bit about AI on the show. You can check a few episodes. I also have to say behind the scenes, I'm trying not to overuse the word because it's become so popular right now. So before we look at AIDA, so at the analytics platform that you lead, let's look at digital twins. Tell me once again, I did hear it a few times, but I still want to ask, what is a digital twin? So you hear certainly a lot of definitions of digital twins, we try to stick to a very easy one, which is a digital twin is a replica in the virtual domain of a physical asset a system or even an infrastructure could be a city. So why do we need digital twins? A digital twin could uh, help different stakeholders to uh, model this uh, physical entity, to monitor its status, to predict its future behavior, to simulate different things in what if a scenarios mode. But ultimately, the digital twin is helping you to take decisions before touching the physical asset. So that's what the high-level definition of a digital twin. But then you have uh, different flavors, I would say, depending on the topic of application, right? Does it mean, you know, model is just something that is in code only? Because I think that for lay people, you know, when you show a digital twin, you always see a simulation, right? But it doesn't have to be really like a real 3D type of simulation. No, exactly. So... You have a 3D type of simulation for specific digital twins. For example, in uh, urban digital twins, or what we call in the European domain local digital twins, certainly you have a rendering in 3D of the cities because you want to see different processes and things that happen in the city in a 3D way. But the digital twin could be pure, I would say, code based with a 2D visualization in a dashboard. Huh? It depends on the on the process that you want to twin. And why do we need to twin? I mean, the physical asset is there. You can just go and check. Depending on the physical asset. The decisions you need to take on that asset and on the evolution of that asset in the future might be really expensive if you do it on the physical asset directly. So imagine that you have a digital twin of a city and you are doing urban planning, for example, and you need to decide what will be the shape of a new neighborhood that you are creating and what is the impact to the current infrastructure. I don't know, water distribution, wastewater treatment, etc. Then it's much better to do it through a digital twin before going to do field studies that might be cost a little bit more. And of course, you, you said before, Digital Twin is uh, linked very often to simulation, but this not only simulation. So uh, I would say comprehensive Digital Twin should include many services. Monitoring, which is in the case of cities, what smart cities have been doing till now. You have a dashboard to see what's happening around the city in different topics, mobility, energy, etc. But then you can also predict in the short term to take fast decisions and also do simulations more for the long term. So the, the usage of this uh, twin, which is unique at the end, is the same twin that allows all these services, is very valuable. But we've been doing modeling and simulations for ages. Why do we need to call them digital twins? Because digital twin, what it enables today, with the availability of data coming from the physical assets, is enable new things. Before, a simulation was just a static model, so a code representation of the behavior of a certain physical asset, and then you play completely offline. A digital twin is kind of connected, if you want. So you get data from the physical twin, and you can learn the models even in a data-driven way. So it's not an expert that will model something. It could also be that with the data, you can model the behavior with that. And a full digital twin is the one where you close the loop, which means you can get the data, you can simulate things, and you can then maybe take decisions and send orders, I'd say, or control orders back to influence the digital twin. So the digital twin is not only the simulation and it ends up in a simulation report, but it ends up in an action taken in the physical asset. 
Okay, so we're talking machine learning probably and deep learning and all it these It could be. I mean, things. it's not, It's not. I mean, there is a, a lot of AI, predictive AI components in digital twins. I mean, you can have, a, if you have historical data and you can understand the behavior of the process you want to twin with AI, certainly machine learning is a good tool. But sometimes you don't have historical data and on the digital twin, what you will host will be analytical models, expert models. I don't know, for example, in uh, flood monitoring, you can use uh, models that are based on typical hydrological research or in, uh, for example, biotechnologies or, or bioprocesses. You know that the bioprocess is governed by uh, chemistry reactions. So then you know how to model that with equations. You don't need AI for that. But uh, both could coexist together in the model layer of the digital twin. So both AI and let's say traditional models. But it all starts with the quality of data. Yes, of course, if you want to have a, a, a real digital twin and not just a simulation flavored as a digital twin, you need to have data that is uh, of uh, good quality, uh, that have the granularity you need, the frequency you need. Most importantly, I think, we don't need to forget the interoperability as- aspects, which means you can do a digital twin, for example, for a city, and the city produces data on the different IoT devices that are connected, but if you want to go to the city number two, to the second city, and uh, you want to replicate the digital twin you did for the previous city, certainly you need to call the data the same way. So that's what we call interoperability of data. And these are the, there are a lot of efforts being done right now, and LIST is contributing to that, to be able to replicate digital twins very fast by ha- having a common and interoperable data layer. So good quality, but also coherence in terms of how we name the data, what we call the data model. Okay, so it means that you know someone has to tag it well in the beginning, or yeah, I'm not getting it correctly. It, no, it's, it's, I don't know if tagging is a good word. So if, if we name this a remote control, it's a remote control for everybody. So that if we measure something, it will be in the same units. There is a definition of how we measure a certain variable that goes into the digital twin, and we do it all in the same way. Do we have enough space and energy to process all the data and store it? Yeah, that's what, when I was saying about granularity and frequency. Actually, you will need to well-define what you create a digital twin, which type of decisions you want to take in order to be sure that the decisions you take in the data are the ones you can pay at the end in terms of storage, but the ones that replies to the decision-making questions that you have. So at the end, the question is, uh, do we have enough space? Uh, certainly, yes, but at the end, there will be a limit, which is uh, even, I would say, uh, related to the footprint we're creating by storing that data. So I think... On the design phase, when you when you are designing a digital twin, it's, it's good to minimize or to be fair with the amount and type of data you need to solve your problems, not to overwhelm that with data just because there is data, I consume it. Just keep what you need for the purpose of your models. I mean, you will need data to create the models, but then you will need data to run the predictions and to retrain those models. Just we need to be sure how much we can afford eh? because that will be part of the operating digital twin and uh, someone will need to pay for that. And you mentioned one of the applications that we can talk about, so smart cities as such. So once again, what are smart cities and where does the digital twin come into play in them? Yeah, so at the end, how do we define a smart city? It's a city that basically is connected, basically by IoT, but the different process of the cities generate data. And we have the city stakeholders, the city managers, people taking decisions on the city, doing it in a data-driven way. So might be visualizing what is the evolution of a certain sensor and taking decisions, for example, on heating or different things. So in Europe, there are a lot of smart cities, uh, big, medium, small, with different maturity levels. But uh, the problem we have is that they have adopted different technology stacks. So replicability is not there. So when, when AI comes and you say, oh, they did the model to predict, I don't know, the, the pollution on a certain street connected to the traffic. Perfect. I want to use that model. And then you realize when you want to run that model that actually you don't have the data at the frequency they have it. And then you kind of start building the model again. And that's a big mistake. So uh, in least we are participating in a big project, which is Sitcom AI, Cities and Communities AI, which is a testing and experimentation facility where we are tackling adoption of AI in uh, smart cities and interoperability because one goes with the other. If you want to really replicate AI, you need to have interoperable uh, data models and data accessibility. So we are trying to go into the direction of smart cities going into what we call local digital twins. There is a big effort from the European Commission to have a European toolbox that can be replicated in different cities and a marketplace that will uh, be there, I hope, in the next years, where AI innovators could contribute, put their innovation and commercialize that model 
to the different cities that adopted the toolbox. So the toolbox ensures the interoperability and a common layer for the services. So everybody will have more or less the same interfaces to operate with the digital twin. And that's where we are going. So LIST is contributing to that. But uh, that's, I would say, the next step of smart cities. So it's eventually deciding on the naming, on the nomenclature that people adapt so then they can, the, the models can be interoperable. I think it's a little bit more than the naming. It's a change of, also of culture. Yes, I mean... Ooh, good years, luck with that. <laughs> yes, yeah. I mean, years before, there have been a lot of smart city projects funded by different European instruments. So we have very nice demonstrators, but I think the volunteer of uh, the European Commission and different uh, directors today is to really be able to replicate those assets. And to that, I think the toolbox is a really good idea. And the projects around to create pilots, because now you have a toolbox, but you will need to create pilots with cities and you need to uh, to, to create a community of AI innovators and um, practitioners on local digital twins that will contribute to a common toolbox and that they will find a way to finance themselves so that they can commercialize the solution there. The, there is a, a little bit the, the, the naming part, so renaming smart city to local digital twins, yes, but I think it's the ecosystem that we are creating that is is unique. I hope that everybody will uh, play the game there, including the market actors, so the AI innovators, that they see the value of contributing to that and not developing their own small local digital twin tools for cities that will end into uh, non-replicable solutions then. Of course. So if LIST is participating, it means it's also going to use Luxembourg as a country for the pilot phase. Yes. yes. Today with Sitcom AI, we're working with one city, City of Differdange, in which we are testing digital twin services, in particular for everything which is related to uh, electromobility. So dimensioning of charging network, how to compensate the demand of electromobility with the uh, generation of renewable energy, in particular solar. So today we build a kind of a small toolbox following the, the European guidelines, of course, that uh, allow the city to create different scenarios of uh, installation of charging points and compensating that with different solar panels installed in their buildings, maybe in a, a private residence, etc. So it's a, it's a first tool, but what is coming is actually a series of projects in which we will take the toolbox that will be delivered next year by a consortium which is led by uh, Spanish companies mainly to run pilots. And the idea is also that from Luxembourg we can bring the cities we can recommend cities to participate in that in that action to get some funding and technical guidance from a consortium where this intends uh, to be there to get funding to run the pilots. So today we started with Differdange. In the future, certainly, we will multiply the number of cities with the common toolbox. It's getting a little bit political, so I have to ask that question. You know, I have to say from my perspective, not all politicians are always eager to take decisions based on evidence. So we are here talking about data-driven decisions. How is it going? I heard the phrase some weeks ago from someone saying, you know, a politician is actually, he has his idea and he's asking you to find the data to prove his idea, not the other way around. And I reflected a lot about that. Because I think we are trying to work in the opposite way. I mean, we are trying to give tools based on data to facilitate the decision. But that uh, political culture, it was not on my mindset. So I was uh, reflecting a little bit about that and trying to, you know, to say, okay, we need to change because uh, it's okay that you have an idea because you have your beliefs, your hypothesis, etc. But if you mandate people to go and look for the data to prove that, it's not the good way. But I think I think that there will be this cultural change. I mean... Uh, Data today is available everywhere. You have uh, large language models. You can ask a lot of questions there. People is much more informed than before. So if the politicians, they don't take data-driven approaches, people will do it and they say, sorry, the data is here. It's open data. I run something very fast. I asked ChatGPT and gave me the answer. So let's discuss. Data is more democratized. So at the end, it's not only say, the politician that will centralize the decision, maybe. Hopefully, I don't know. I'm not a politician, so I cannot uh, give you... More Lucky you, I have to say. Yeah, it's, I think it's not a very easy job. We talked a lot about digital twins and the possibilities that they uh, show us, but there are also limits. So I know you prepared a pub quiz question about it. So German, if you can ask the question and listeners remember the answer only at the end of the podcast. Yeah, the question is, uh, what are the limits of digital twins in terms of what are the things that actually we can twin and what are the things that actually we cannot twin? Like human beings, for example, we can't. No, we have the human digital twins. Okay, great. So remember the answer only at the end of the podcast. You mentioned uh, 
I asked ChatGPT as well. So let's move on to the other hat that you have. So AIDA, it's pretty new, right? I mean, at least you've been there like six months. Yes. So AIDA exists. It was a, 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 a platform that was provided to the research infrastructure. I joined in uh, December last year. What we are trying to do is to set up a number of services that goes beyond just the provisioning infrastructure to research. So research needs a machine with a certain configuration or access to a high-performance computer, then the team was facilitating access to that, giving guidance, etc. But uh, I think we can do more. And uh, what we are developing are services that are related to data, to AI, to digital twins, also infrastructure provisioning for all those services too. So the researcher can come and not only take a, a, you know, an SSH connection to a server, but toolkits, technology that they can reuse for the research. So we work normally with the researchers, so we understand the needs. They come to us when they need to maybe increase the level of uh, readiness level, so the TRL. And for example, they need to build a demonstrator and they can rely on our platform. They can. We have software engineers, data scientists and uh, system administrator that could help them to go faster into demonstrating what they are trying to do, what they are researching, right? So that's the role we are shaping for either. And that means locally for least researchers, so we work mainly for different research units of LIST in different topics. So we have projects in, uh, in IT, but also we are supporting projects from remote sensing and um, hydrological topics, etc. But also something that we are trying to promote is uh, the development of uh, joint AI labs to increase the AI adoption in industry. Because at the end, some industry say, okay, I have all this AI now coming every week, something new. I see there is a value, and this doesn't require to run a full research project. But with the knowledge we have, the platform we have, we can certainly work close to the industry. That's the role of LIST. LIST, uh, normally, the intention is also to work closer to the industry partners to help them to adopt AI technologies that are in the market. Could be things that we did internally in AI, could be off-the-shelf things that we can test and experiment together, and we can help them to uh, increase the adoption. So that's also our external, I would say, role that we are trying to push forward. So not only serving internally, but uh, serving externally without conflicting with the research units, eh, of course, because they are doing research and we are not doing research. What we are doing is uh, just uh, increasing the adoption of AI and data analytics. And how is it going? I mean, the adoption? Because, you know, we are talking a lot about it. Yes, it's everywhere. Yes. But I don't think, I think that it's, it's so in, easy. It depends on the industry. There are certain industries or categories of industries that are more risk takers. And they say, okay, let's do it. But you know that when you talk about AI, you talk also about AI compliance. And that's where also from AIDA, we are giving support. I mean, we recently launched, maybe you saw it, an AI sandbox. We are focusing for the moment on a bias of large language models. So imagine a company wants to adopt LLMs to do chatbots. Sounds great. I mean, we can talk to the customer, but that model that you put there to run the chatbot could say whatsoever. It could hallucinate, could be biased, and that could kill your reputation. I don't see it as a barrier. I think this is a, a kind of a awareness that we are also creating, and the AI Act is helping to do that. What we are trying to do from AIDA is to give uh, tools to the different companies adopting AI also to confront to the regulation, say, hey, what I'm trying to do, is it compliant or not? Because if you go just with the technology car saying, I can do for you a chatbot or a predictive model that would solve your problem. Yeah, perfect. But uh, can I deploy it? And that's the other hat. And we try to jump between these two huts. If you're more interested in, in chatbots and AI and all that, uh, I recommend you to listen to the interview I had with uh, Jordi Cabot, also from LIST. We talked a bit more about hallucinations too. And then another one I'm thinking of is a researcher also from LIST, uh, Alex Tantar. We talked a lot about trustworthy and explainable AI, and it was a very interesting kind of philosophical discussion as well. It was supposed to last shorter, but I just couldn't help myself more than an hour of discussing. So yes, if you're interested in that, do check it out too. And now coming back, another hat of yours, let's say. So, you know, we talked uh, a bit AI, we talked a little bit uh, on, on different uh, subjects of the digital twins, but there is also the mobility that comes into play and the spin-off that you co-founded. If you could tell us a little bit about Motion S, what it was about and how it is to collect mobility data in general. Actually, Motion S started as a research project we had uh, together with the uh, my former colleague Rafael Frank from s and at the Vehicular Lab, in which we, we started to see how with mobile phones we could uh, profile the behavior of drivers. That raised interest of one local insurance company that brought into a patent, and then we were confronted to the situation, A, there is maybe some research to do, but there is an opportunity to exploit what you guys did. 
and they say, okay, let's create a spin-off. And uh, I had the, the pleasure to run the spin-off first as CTO and then as CEO for eight and a half years. It was a very nice experience because I, ha- I had also at that time, I was a postdoc at the uni to decide to go to, a, to an entrepreneurship uh, pathway that for me was completely uh, unusual. But I think we did a lot of cool things there. And uh, we started with this uh, driver behavior profile with the insurances, but then very rapidly we say, okay, there is a little, a lot of more things to do here if we just not focus on uh, the behavior of the driver. If we have mobility data, we can do a lot of things. So we started working with uh, oil companies that wanted to monitor the usage of the fleets and the emissions of the fleets. We also worked with uh, cities. And the most recent I have been working on before uh, leaving MotionS was related to uh, connected car data. So if you see the trend on mobility data, I mean, this has been generated from cars, I'm talking from private cars, first with devices, then with smartphones, because uh, everybody could develop an app uh, very easily to collect uh, location updates. But now we are coming back to the centralized approach in which the vehicle manufacturer developed a, a, I would say, data platforms. And you have much more data than what you can collect with the smartphone. You can understand from the car everything, the maintenance, the status of the different dashboard lights, uh, how the user is making use of different features of the car. And that opens a lot of uh, new things. I'm trying to continue with this topic a little bit, discussing with different stakeholders, because I, I really think there is a value on exploiting the data that is generated today by cars. So today, a company that wants to develop a mobility solution, you don't need to think anymore on how to collect the data. The data is already collected. It's just how to access the data. Of course, there is a pricing, and you need to see if your business model, the solution you want to create, fits that price. But that kills already one pain point, which was uh, collecting data you know, in a complete way from all your customers. That for us also was a, a pain in the neck. Huh? Of uh, course, I can imagine. But you're saying that the data is collected, so where is it stored? So uh, what you see that happened in the market is every brand, or I would say every group of brands, have uh, been developing platforms that collect that data and centralize it. So I don't know, I'm speaking about the BMW. They have a BMW car data API in which you can go and access data from your vehicle. If you have your, the VIN number, you can subscribe, you can get your data. So this data is stored by the manufacturer or the group or a company mandated by, uh, by them. And then you can access via subscription-based. You think like a car is a sensor, so it's an IoT. So via MQTT, this data is sent to them. Then you consume and you pay per type of data and volume of data you want as a solution provider. But of course, this is just, you know, one person data. In order to provide the solution, you need to actually aggregate the data that is collected by BMW. Exactly. And that's what that's, you see that in the market appear what, what I call data aggregators. So you have companies that actually are buying tons of data from fleets, anonymizing and then selling. We have access, for example, at least data from one of those providers. For the whole customer, it's around 17,000 vehicles. We bought a historical data set over the year, including data coming from trucks, from buses, etc. So we don't know who was the driver. We don't know even from two trips if it was the same vehicle. We just have location updates in the country from movie vehicles. So there is a business model, I would say, for the aggregated data. And there is another business model for the individualized data. Because when you want to create a service for an individual, like, I don't know, a telematics insurance, a maintenance contract that depends on the way you drive, etc., then you need data from one person. And for that, it's another completely different business model. You pay per, per person, but there is the GDPR that starts. And you have the compliance there. The, I work with many providers in the past, but uh, you need to ensure that the ultimate person that will allow you to grant the data is the one who's driving, the owner of the car. Because the data is stored, yes, but whenever it is shared to a third party, you need to put back into the loop the owner. So you have in your connected car app saying company X wants to access this data for this purpose. And then you accept or you deny, then you can uh, go out from that when you want. But... Uh, I don't see that as a limitation. For me, the limitation more now is uh, on how we can create services on that data that are self-sustainable in terms of uh, the business model behind. So how can you do something based on that data that the customer will be willing to pay and you can do a profit on top? (laughs) You have actually your your business uh, thinking hat right now. now You don't sound like a researcher (laughs) anymore, which is interesting to, to see for sure. I also have to say that from my perspective as a driver... I don't know whether I want to share my driving behavior data either. There are a lot of studies uh, about the willingness to share data based on incentives, based on also gamification components. We played a lot with that. And I can uh, confirm that there is a certain category of people that say, I will not share it. I mean, 
The problem is always the, the proportion of people that don't want to share it. Whenever you have a disruptor in the market that comes with an idea that say, if you share, I give you this and nobody else can give it to you and you want it, then, you know, you start going on your witness. Uh, yes. And I think this is happening more and more. Yes, for sure. I mean, we see that also in our buyer, you know, behavior in a way. So we say no, 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 but at a certain moment, it's just so much more okay, comfortable to the, say yeah, yes. Right? They ship it to me tomorrow, so why shouldn't I click? <laughs> yes, exactly. Without naming anyone no, here, no, no, no. right? <laughs> of course not. Um, listen, I wanted to ask you about Motion S a little bit more in the sense that, you know, this was the first spin off of SNT. I don't get researchers here very often who also had the chance to do a bit of business. Was it difficult in the beginning? Were you prepared for it? Is no, is there a way prepared. to prepare, actually? Uh, no, it's try and error. So why did you go for it? I mean, it's, so, it's such a risky thing to do. I, I think at that time, I believe a lot in what I was doing. We had the chance to work with one key partner. It was Balois Insurance in Luxembourg that was uh, creating a concept around that technology. Therefore, I said, okay, we have surrounded of experts that know exactly how to make a use of the technology for a customer, I would say, a set that they already have. So it's, uh, it's a very nice opportunity to try. It's, it's like uh, usual, you know, you, you try to see how, many, how much risk you will have. And in that case, the risk was low. The problem is how to get this sustainable. So you can have one, two, three good, I would say, projects. The problem is how you convert those projects and assets you built into products that uh, you can have sustainable revenue. And that's, I think, the problem that, uh, uh, that we have, that uh, we have a lot of wonderful projects. But in order to have a volume, certainly you, we would uh, have needed much more investment and the stakeholders that were committed to say, OK, I believe in this. We know that this needs five years of cash and we go into one direction. And uh, certainly that was not the case. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, because Motion S is not there anymore. Exactly. Right. And this is this is a sad part because I also have to say that this is a challenge for me as a podcast producer, you know, the sustainability part, right? Because you get budgets for one year and then you never know. You need to provide numbers, you need to prove and you need to innovate all the time to actually give something new and something more and something. And, you know, there's a limit to that too, right? It, it's a difficult world for sure. And being an entrepreneur in Luxembourg is also particularly difficult, I have to say. I, don't know I have you... no experience in other countries, but I can I can only talk positive about all the instruments we have, the support we have, connection with different stakeholders, the work also of uh, Lux Innovation, Ministry of the Economy, the research centers, because during my uh, entrepreneurship uh, adventure, I was working with SNT, with LIST in different projects to always try to keep... Uh, the platform, because what we had at that time was a platform up to date with the most recent advances we could put. So I think that the context helps a lot. Of course, the other side of the coin is that whenever you want to grow and to hire people, it's complicated for a startup. In terms of salaries as a startup, it's very difficult to compete. Attracting talent, you cannot pay uh, what the, the market pays. So then you need to be smart and uh, look for solutions, mix a hybrid mode you need to adopt. Yes, sure. Going back to data, yes. I was just wondering, because you said uh, nowadays the cars already collect so much data about our driving. So what kind of data is already collected? So there are many levels of data there. I mean, the car manufacturer certainly collects data to understand how each component of the car is being treated, used, how it reacts to different conditions, etc. That's more for product development, so engineering So if I slam teams. the door, it's also collected? No, I don't joking, think we're right not. to that level, but uh, certainly uh, they monitor the level of, uh, of your battery, the temperature of each cell, I mean, uh, different sensors that you have on the engine. And then there is another, I would say, a level of abstraction, which is the data that the third party that we create a solution could use. There you have uh, location updates, uh, I don't know, uh, maintenance levels, might be some, some uh, manufacturer, for example, they give you the indication if the convertible roof or the top roof is open or closed, so you can create analytics of how the person is using this car. There are many levels of data, and there is certainly the level I mentioned before, the aggregated data is very useful also for, for example, governments, traffic planners. Imagine that a big brand that deploys thousands of cars in Luxembourg can tell you, okay, you know, at this spot, I detect that 10% of the vehicles that pass are triggering the ESP or the ABS. So maybe there is a problem with the infrastructure. So there are a lot of discussion around that. There are even directives in that sense. But of course, that data has a value. There is always a fight to who's paying for that, the one who collects. And uh, we need to create a, a business model also about that. So yeah, many levels of aggregation, many levels of usage, but uh, certainly 
tons of data that they are collecting uh, in terabytes a day per vehicle or gigabytes per day per vehicle. I don't know exactly the number. And when it comes to cities, okay, we talked driver and mobility, and it kind of also comes into play with the cities. What kind of other data smart cities collect normally? It's for, for more for mobility? Is it more for no, traffic no. control? What, what is it? It depends. I mean, uh, you have uh, certainly data from moving things is uh, interesting to have this uh, dynamic part, but it's, a, it's tough for cities to collect data from every single thing moving in the city. You can certainly maybe equip your fleets with some telematics device to collect data, but that's a fraction of the traffic. I have to stop you here. Telematics, because you use it a lot, and yeah. this is not a term that I'm very familiar with. What is it, actually? Uh, I don't have a definition for that, but uh, in uh, in vehicular technology, we use telematics as the, uh, the word that implies a generation of telemetry from the car. Okay. So it's... Uh, you, telemetry means uh, yeah, data element, a measurement that you do from the car. So in the market, that's called telematics. Okay, thank you. So coming back, so you said not everything that is moving. No, I mean, uh, certainly having information about things that is moving would enable a scenarios. Like, for example, you want to understand the pollution propagation, then you know that one of the sources of pollution are the cars that are moving. Then if you have data from those vehicles, I think you have a, a volume you can infer if that pollution is generated by those vehicles or by other sources. Huh? So other data that uh, the cities collect are basically IoT data from sensors, sensors they collect, so uh, weather stations, uh, even um, energy telemetries. Uh, for example, with City of Defatange, we are collecting the data from the different counters. They have the public buildings from uh, the electricity provider, and we are you know, running analytics on that. Everything that is connected and generated data via IoT or via platforms uh, from a provider is eligible, I mean, to be captured and injected into a digital twin for a city. And is it also related to the future, hopefully one day trend of self-driving cars or not really? Good question. I mean, uh, the self-driving car actually generates its own data to understand the environment, right? Because whenever it decides to do a maneuver, it applies AI over the understanding on the context to react on the left, the right, stop, etc. There are efforts also to let the car have less amount of uh, data inside the car to collect less data and use data that is also on the cloud about the understanding of the city. And that's the data that might be there. That, that this is the overlap. I mean, cities might be they have a uh, big cities, well-defined, uh, you know, models of the buildings, of the shapes of the infrastructure, and that could be used by the autonomous vehicle to uh, help on the decision making. There is always a trade-off between yeah, the, the local control loop and the, the one you can get from outside. And then crossing the borders, for example. In which sense you mean? Well, in the sense that, you know, you might have a very good internet connection to analyze and whatever you go to another country and then your car stops working. because That's well. a big topic. I work on that when I did my PhD on uh, wireless uh, heterogeneity. And I still, being a frontalier myself, I still cannot understand how I'm cutting my connection when I drive to France, to Belgium, to Germany. I think this is more a commercial than a technical decision, but uh, yeah, indeed, okay. cross-border is an issue. Yes. Well, then we have Starlink. I shouldn't be men mentioning that name. Why not? <laughs> well, there has it's to be a solution. Market. Yes, yeah. it's part of the market. It's there. For yeah. sure, for some people, for the yeah. chosen ones. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, so I jumped uh, far away to the self-driving cars, but I also wanted to discuss one more thing before we slowly start uh, to wrap up, which is, you know, all these automated driver assistance systems. I think that's how you, because you use a lot of ADAS, but of course uh, I'm not very fond of abbreviations. So there you go, advanced driver assistance systems. Uh, what are they and how are they also kind of playing a role within the, the data collection of, of driving behavior? The ADAS is actually, there are actually features of the car that are preventing you to have an accident in a passive or, or an active mode, right? And uh, the equipment that is installed in the cars to react to those situations are producing data, right? In the past, some of the research I was doing with uh, one of my uh, most recent PhDs, uh, Dr. Marcelo, who was actually in, in Motion S as a research fellow, we have been developing actuarial algorithms to understand how the, the I would say, the, the ADAS data could explain your risk. If you see what we were doing before on driver behavior, it's like, okay, I capture with some data, and that's what I did when I founded Motion S. Let's see how he accelerates, he brakes, he steers, with just GPS coordinates and some accelerometers. But today, you control less and less your car with the steering wheel. It's the car who has the control. So actually, it's not, uh, it's not your behavior, it's the behavior of the algorithm, plus the fact that you have to take the control back sometimes. So if you see 
uh, we evolved from having scores based on your driving dynamics to having scores like Tesla published recently, who runs actually their own insurance. The score is, I think, is based on six parameters, which is uh, all car related. Is how many disengagement against events you have per kilometer, how much rear collision warnings you have, or front collision warning, etc. So it's the algorithm who talks and uh, gives data to the insurer to say, okay, he's, he's creating six alerts per 100 kilometers, while well, this guy's creating only one alert. So there might be an issue there. And uh, the behavior of the guy is always the same. It's just the, you know, the, the way the context is influencing his driving which is also part of the research we published with Dr. Marcel in the past. Uh, the problem I have with uh, with those systems is that actually they kind of don't let us behave as a driver anymore in a way. Mm. They prevent us from accidents. But of course, just like with GPS, sometimes we're driving, we have a GPS and we quarrel with it and say, like, yeah, I know I need to go straight, but I prefer to go left. The same with these systems. I've seen uh, numerous times drivers who are like, yeah, it's great, it's there, but I want to do something else. Right. So in this case, when you're you're talking about Tesla and these um, dangerous behaviors is because the driver was not listening to the system or what's what's the reason there? Because uh, the system the, kind of decides on you, let's say, yeah, right? The it, system it decides on you or whatever. until the car cannot decide per se and will give you the, the control back. Ah, and, uh, and what you do and in that case. that's what you call a disengagement. Exactly. Ah, okay, okay. And one of the variables of that uh, score that I was mentioning is actually the number of disengagements you have per unit of driving. Because in general, you as a driver, mm. I, I assume oh, yeah. you drive as well, right? Yeah, a lot, yeah. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, what kind but of a driver It depends on the you? brand of car I drive. Oh, okay. For me, there is a trust relation that you build with the automations of your car. I have two brands at home. My wife has the most, I would say, the, the, the one where the algorithms, I feel they work good. And I have a French car, which I normally disable half of the stuff because I think he overreacts. So the car is overreacting, then I prefer to disable. But there are other brands where you say, oh, this is helping me. So you create the trust and then you disengage more from the steering wheel because you know the car with a very low probability will go into a situation. So for me, it's a matter of uh, yeah, quality of sensors you put, software that you put, AI or non-AI software, so control software that you put on top of that data and the interface between you and the car that you understand that the car is taking the control or that you are taking the control. The human uh, machine interface there is key. If you don't know that the car is, is having the control there because you have good indicators, you will be always you know, taking the control and might be feeling that there is a reaction from the car. So again, it's, for me, it's a matter of trust. And you see that the different uh, manufacturers are yeah. evolving, but at different speeds, I have to say. That's true. It's also very interesting when you rent a car somewhere, right? Because then you get a new system and you, for some reason... Maybe in the past they were telling you a bit more. Now you just get the car and suddenly, you know, you start driving and you figure out, oh, there is some kind of a uh, assistance system I didn't know of and what's going on, right? It's yeah. a bit stressful sometimes, I have to I say. Know, I agree. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. So, but also interesting as a, you know, it's a discovery. Oh, they're doing this now in that yeah. brand or whatever the, the, else. The discussion in that topic is always, do we really need to arrive to level five of automation? Do we really need to, do people will accept to be completely in a self-driving situation, or they would like to have a certain level of control. I'm more, because my, I'm getting old, I'm more of the opinion that uh, level four would be a very good compromise. And maybe there will be some specific niche where level five is needed. So what is level four for you? Level four is a very advanced automation. I mean, you still have a steering wheel, you still uh, need to react in some situations, but uh, most of the basic operation, including uh, overtaking in the highway, etc., is there in five Normally, ideally, you don't need to have the, the control of the car anymore. You, you have seen maybe the shuttle running here in Belvoir. That's also a project that uh, yes. one of my colleagues is working on. So that, that is a nice use case because you are saving the cost of the driver in a business model of transporting people. But an individual driving, I think level four would be enough. Yeah, well, I, I like driving. Me too. So too. somehow, yes, exactly. I, I Level four sounds, sounds cool to me too. But again, it's trust thing, right? And then I'm sure that different makes of cars will have different ideas of what level four means for the customers. Exactly. There is a kind of a guideline or high level definition of what level four is. And then you have systems and algorithms that these companies are developing. These companies are the tier one suppliers, of course. And then they do a, a panache, as we say in French. And they say, okay, this is between three and four. This is between two and three, depending on which situation the car covers. Yeah. 
And one last thing about the assistance in driving. Do we have data that says that the number of, of accidents has decreased because of all the assistance we get in cars? Yeah, there's certainly. A, I don't know at European level. At the time I was doing research on that with uh, my PhD fellow, uh, we were working a lot with data from the UK because they have a really nice uh, systematized way of collecting data, trying to understand also the causes of the accident. And there you see the trend. I mean, uh, you see that they're advancing the technology of the car. So we drive more and more miles per year and you have less and less fatal accidents. I think it's not only the problem of the frequency, the frequency is reducing, but also the the severity in terms of uh, injury. Then you have the other side of the coin for the insurance, the severity is increasing because uh, the cars are equipped with such advanced technology, but that whenever it crashes, it costs a fortune to repair. So the claim severity is higher, but in terms of uh, saving lives, the severity is going down. Last thing, you know, the Digital Twin Innovation Center. So we have the word innovation. So what's the innovation in the digital twin sphere? That's a very good question. I think there are different levels there. First of all, there is a lot of work still to do on uh, having a certain digital twin architecture that is uh, replicable, interoperable. So topics about data interoperability, data harmonization, digital twin architecture, that's something that still, even if we're building a toolbox, there are new things coming in terms of research. And then you have, for me, all which is the innovation in terms of the models you are building, in particular AI models, that you are putting into a digital twin. So covering more topics with AI and uh, being able to predict much more things that you do with the traditional models. There are other things. Uh, we are also trying to investigate how to have a conversational interface with digital twin because uh, you see a digital twin and what you see, a control center with a big map and a lot of plots. But today you could think about having a conversation with the twin. I mean, if it's a real twin, I can talk to him, right? So you can uh, you can write questions, and uh, these questions are transferred into uh, running models behind, getting you the output, and uh, putting you in a meaningful and comprehensive way. So that's, I would say, three examples of innovations are a digital twin, but there are certainly much more, because each topic, each uh, sectoral topic that we say has its own innovation roadmap. Eh? So currently, how do you talk to the digital twin with code, basically? So today, uh, what we have uh, at least is actually uh, maps plus dashboard based. But uh, we are trying to see, but we need to see where we get the resources. Actually, you mentioned before, Professor Cabot, uh, they have a framework called BESA for low code and uh, no code. And they have a chatbot framework. So certainly an opportunity there to see how we implement that and connect into the digital twin. Okay, so I wish you no hallucinations, or at least and no limited bias. Yeah, and no, no bias, bias, no hallucinations. Exactly, and digital twins that you can talk to. And this means loads of very cool demonstrators, right? Because then again, you have to show the public uh, what you're doing. And it's not always easy, right? Because, yes, people don't necessarily get excited about uh, loads of code. I do. But some of them prefer simulations, for example, right? And especially if you're supposed to talk to politicians that take decisions later on. They want to the report with the simulation outcome, yeah. There you go. And now, as usual, at the end of the podcast, we solve the pub quiz question. So, German, if you can remind our listeners what the question was about, and then please give us the answer. The question was, what are the limits of digital twins in terms of what we can twin and what we cannot twin? So we have discussed during the, the podcast today about mostly about application for cities, but actually we can twin everything that uh, produces data from which we can build models, and those models could help us to take decisions. So you mentioned before human being. The human is a system. It has different, I would say, components, physiological, uh, biochemical, psychological, And all those things, even if they don't produce systematically data there, could be modeled in a way. So you have, for example, uh, things that you can measure in the body, activity, movement, some parameters like weight, height, etc. That could be part of uh, some of the models I mentioned. And there are other things that you will model just with the theoretical things. So at the end, actually, there is no limit in what you want to twin, but uh, the richer digital twin, what you can get actually data out of it and you can have something living because if you just have modeled something process and you know uh, you can only do simulation then it's just a simulation the, the beauty of digital twin is that, that you can 
collect data and see the evolution of the twin along the time. And that, I think, is the, the boundary or the limit I was mentioning before. You can virtually twin everything, but the value you will maximize it whenever you can collect data in a periodic way and you see the evolution of the twin and you can take actual decisions. This is really interesting. And also, I think it touches upon this uh, sweet spot of do we have enough data to actually have a digital twin that is meaningful? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. But again, it, it depends. It depends on the on the process we are on the, or the system we are trying to twin. But sometimes we say, yeah, it would be nice to have a twin. And then you realize, yeah, but I need to build the models from scratch just by understanding with equations, with uh, just theoretical models, how it works. And then you're introducing a lot of bias and error in that process. So there is always a, a compromise that you need to see what is the value again of you, what you can get as a service and enabling decision making and the data that you need. Of course. To do that. So good luck with all that. And thank you so much for sharing. Thanks to you. It was a very really nice talk. And this is it for today. Don't forget to subscribe, to follow us, to read what we are saying about all the scientific subjects. Suggest guests as usual. We are present on all the social media and always open for your opinion. This was Silax and my name is Hanna Siemaszko.